All right. Uh, if you're on the stream, uh, please let me know that you can hear me. in a couple minutes. I'm just connecting here. All right, I'll start at 7.31, I guess. Evaluated the whole thing. What? Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, so I guess kind of uh, before I start, uh, so I'll just answer uh, uh, Siddhartha's question uh, for everyone. Uh, and the answer is kind of like this. So this is advanced material. Uh, so if you don't want to know about it, you don't need to. Uh, so basically, uh, here is one issue that might come up. So let's say that you have like A and that's three and B and that's five and you are trying to trace something like this. So if A is greater than five, six let's say, actually I'll do smaller than six and then and B is equal to five, something like this. And if it's like that, then you'll say hi and if it's not like that, then you'll say hello. So something like that. Uh, so first of all, what's the value here? So if A is five, uh, 3 and B is 5, then it is the case that A is smaller than 6 because 3 is smaller than 6 and B is equal to 5. So those are both true. So that means that the value of this is going to be high. And that's what R says. Uh, so the question on this chord was, well, um, it so happens that in this case, what do you need to do in order to verify whether you need to say hi or hello? Well, you need to check whether this is true and also this is true. So to trace it, there is no two ways about it. You would say, okay, so we'll transform that as much as we can. So what can we do? Well, we can compute A is small, so we can substitute the value for A. So this would be three is smaller than six, and this would be five is equal to five. And then the next time we again try to compute whatever we can, 
So in this case, we'll say, okay, so this is like that. So that's the value is true and the value of that is true. And then the next time you would say, okay, true and true is true. So this is one of the rules that we had in lecture one. So this just becomes true. And at this point you're saying if true, hi, if not, hello. So this is true. So that means that the value of this whole thing is high. So that's unambiguous. Uh, so the question is, what if the values are different? So what if, so I'll just copy and paste this. So what if it's like this? So here we're saying if A is smaller than six or B is equal to five. So what this is saying is if at least one of those is true, so if at least one of A is smaller than six or B is equal to five is true, then the value is high. So when you try to trace it, at first it's gonna look the same. So I'll just copy this and then change the end to an or. So we substitute three smaller than six, five equals to five. Uh, so then it becomes a little bit ambiguous because what R can do if it's smart, and R is pretty dumb, but it's smart enough to do this, is to notice, oh, like actually three is smaller than six is true, and they don't even need to know whether five is equal to five because if three is smaller than six, then it's already gonna be true because true or anything is gonna be true. So then it becomes a question of how do you trace it exactly, right? So do you say, okay, like R is gonna figure out that this is true, and then it doesn't really need to check whether five is equal to five. Uh, so yes, R in practice will not check that, or at least might not check that, but we are not really concerned about it. So as far as we're concerned, we'll trace it exactly the same way. So we'll say this is going to be true or true, and that will convert true or true to just true. And then it's high again. So this is really advanced, well, not like really advanced material, but this really is advanced material, not really advanced, but advanced. Uh, so the thing I wanna point out here is that the way we are writing our code, this kind of thing should never matter. And the reason is, well, when might it matter? Well, for one, it might be more efficient uh, to just say, oh, like this is true, so I don't need to see anything else. Uh, another way in which this might matter is if it's the case that trying to compute this has some kind of effect, then it matters when you, where, whether you try to compute it or not. The way we are writing our functions we never have it be the case that this kind of thing is going to have an effect other than you figure out whether five is equal to five or not. So as long as you're care so the most common side effect would be printing something to the screen. We never, well, like in one example early on, I did a print inside the function, but we never print inside the function. If you don't do that, and if you don't use something that's, that's called global variables, then it doesn't matter that in practice R might skip finding out whether five is equal to five. And that's because whether you do or don't, the outcome is gonna be the same. Uh, so that was kind of uh, advanced material. So uh, you'll come back to it, I guess, like maybe in third year, if you're interested in that, maybe we'll mention it in like 190 briefly, but that was kind of uh, the kind of hash, hashtag nerd faced aggression. Uh, so, okay, so what I want to do today is data frames. And uh, so there's, uh, I don't know how many, but the, like, I don't know, like 12 people uh, here in the room. And I can't, so maybe I'll try to do like Zoom breakout rooms or something next time, but they don't have it set up now. So we will have some exercises that I'll ask people in the room do, because I think, especially in the beginning, it's, kind of the lectures are just here to entertain you. It's really all about, I hope you're a little bit entertained, but it's really all about the exercises. 
Uh, so we'll try to do some in lecture exercises. Uh, I should also say, so it's always the situation that when you're just starting the semester, it's a little bit tricky because you can't just say, oh, like do an exercise today and then tomorrow and then the next day because people have other stuff as well. And even in the summer, people have other stuff as well. Uh, so we're a little bit ahead in terms of the lectures. I think if you're just a beginner in terms of you actually getting up to speed in terms of doing exercises. So I'm trying to compress that schedule as much as possible, but at the same time, like you got to be a little bit reasonable about it as well. Uh, so my hope is that by the end of next week, we'll be kind of caught up in terms of you doing enough exercises that the lecture is not really ahead of where you are. Right now, you might be feeling like I'm a little bit ahead of you, but we'll, we'll try to fix it. So, okay, all right. So uh, last time, if you're, so, and so, we're doing data frames today, uh, and that's it, just data frames. Uh, so data frames, uh, so there's kind of minor variations. Uh, so uh, sometimes you'll see things called tibbles. Those are also data frames. Uh, and what it is is basically tables, spreadsheets of data. So last time what we had was we had, if you remember, the medical specialties, and we had the annual salaries that corresponded to those medical specialties. So that was kind of a table, but it was an awkward kind of table, right? So the way it worked is we had kind of like column one, and column one was, so I'll do kind of something short, so like family cardiologist. And then we had something like column two, and that was whatever, 250, 550, right? Uh, so that's a way of storing a table. That's essentially what it is, right? So if you imagine that the first column is the specialties and the second column is the salaries, well, that works. It's just that we wrote it down awkwardly as two different things, two different vectors. And the way they're connected is we just knew that a call one at one corresponds to a call two at one and the same for call one at two and call two at two. Right? So that's the kind of thing that we did last time. So this is what you can do with just vectors. So a data frame basically offers you a way of achieving exactly that, but in a more organized way that's less error prone. So here there, there could be all sorts of problems, right? So let's say that you forget the cardiologist here. R would not know that there is a problem until you try to go call one and two. Right? Uh, so uh, here's how you can do it. So that's going to be, so we'll say offers is going to be a data frame and we'll have two columns. One column is going to co be called amount. Uh, so five, three, three, I'll just do three. And then I'll do a second column that's the specialty. And that would be like family and cardiologist, cardio uh, and ortho. Okay, something like this. Uh, so this is how you write it. So this is the name of the column. And then this is the data that would go in the column and that should be a vector. And then you do a comma and then you say the second column is a specialty and that would also be a vector. So that's how you can create a column in inside of R. In general, what you'll see later on is you read the data from a file or maybe you download it from the internet. It's very rare that you would actually type data into R. That's like not a good way to do it, right? Because it's very error prone. It's hard to, it's hard to check. So it's much better to enter the data into Excel or something and then read the, date, the Excel file from R. Or better yet, once you graduate and become an important person, you pay someone to do it for you. Uh, and then, then you just read it into R. Uh, that's, that's what I do. Uh, so, uh, okay. So, well, I don't directly pay people. The, the university pays them. It's, 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 it's a nice setup. Uh, so, okay. So, that's like that. So, one thing to note is that I wrote it like this, where amount is aligned with spec. R doesn't care about it. So you could equally have written something like this, 
uh, or something like this or whatever, R, R, R doesn't care. Uh, so it's just that it's nice to write it like this because it's neater. Uh, so R Studio uh, helps you with that. So here you'll notice that if I have this kind of thing and then I put the cursor here and press enter, R Studio automatically aligns the amount of the spec. So that just it just analyzes whatever code I have and tries to make it nicer. If I just press enter, that's the usual thing. Uh, you'll notice that that happens when you define a function as well, that there is this nice indentation. This is not really meaningful for R. R doesn't care about white space. Kind of as far as R is concerned, this is just as good. But R is trying to help you write code that's neater, and you should probably follow whatever it suggests usually, although different people will have different aesthetic preferences. So, okay. Uh, so that's my data frame. Uh, so I can check uh, what it looks like. And if you say what the value of offers, R will tell you, okay, this is the value of offers. So it's this nice table with a column named amount and a column named spec. Uh, so you can also say view offer like so. And R will give you this nice kind of table that you can play around with. So here, I can. So, so the amounts are sorted, but I can say I want to sort like this, right? So this is now going to be like alphabetic order uh, for the specialties, stuff like that. And it's just convenient to look at the data this way. Uh, so you can also, uh, so we've defined offers. Uh, you see? So if I press environment, so I can press this and that's again, open the view window. So if I have, so here it doesn't matter. You can look at it every which way. When the data set becomes larger, it becomes much more important that you can view it this way. Uh, so, okay. So that's, so that's like that. Uh, so usually, like I said, we won't, so it's useful to know that you can do it, but usually that's not how we're going to load the data. Uh, so I want to do a few examples with uh, a data set. Uh, so uh, what I want you to do is run this once. So what this does is it just downloads a data set named baby names uh, into R. So this is something that you just type in the once and it just installs in your R Studio, uh, R rather environment. I don't know why it's 5.3 megabytes. That seems like a lot. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll check what's on Discord. Uh, yeah, so there, there will not be a side effect example. That was advanced material. If you like Google side effects programming uh, in whatever is your favorite language, if you don't have a favorite language, probably don't want to know about this at this stage. Uh, if you do, just Google it and there's going to be examples. Okay, hi, CX330. Uh, okay. So this is now installed. Uh, so in my code, I can now write library baby names. Uh, so what this does is it loads this data set. So I now have the data frame baby names, or it's really a table. Uh, and that looks like this. Uh, so here, so this is data from the US census. Uh, starting from 1880 and up to 2017. And what it has is for each name, for each year, for each sex, it has the number of babies with that name. Uh, so again, you can kind of play around with the, with the data uh, in the view. So here, uh, so the minimum number uh, of uh, of, uh, of babies that need to be there is five in order for it to be recorded. Uh, you might imagine that there is like whatever kind of like different spellings that are kind of unique and then there's just the one person uh, and there's a lot of them so those are not in the data set. Uh, so here I can get the largest n at first and you see that uh, the largest number of babies of any name of any sex is Linda in 
1947. Uh, so Michael is in fourth place in 1957. So, okay. So that's like that. Uh, so uh, here you see kind of the usefulness of the view because if I just say baby names like this, it'll display it. Uh, but so here by default, it'll cut it off. But like if it tried to display two million rows, I would be in trouble because I would have to wait for quite a while until it managed to print all of it. And then once it printed all of it, what would I do with it? It's two million rows. You can't, can't really do anything with it. With view, it's very convenient. So you can scroll, you can sort, whatever. So much, much better. Uh, so, okay. So you can access... Uh, entries in this table. Uh, so here we have kind of the row, uh, the row numbers. So it is actually sorted by N. So I can say something like baby names at two comma. And what that will give, uh, what that will give me is row number two of baby names. So let me Uh, so, th so this is the original order here. So I just sorted it by, so I just made it so that the rows here are like one, two, three. And then row number two is this. So what I said here is baby names and then I gave the row number and I said nothing about the columns. So it gave me all the columns. So are people comfortable with this kind of thing? So I don't know how many people did matrices in high school? Okay, so not, not everyone. Uh, so, so basically the idea is like this, right? So you can specify which row you're interested in. So in this case, I specified that I'm interested in row number two. And you can in principle specify what column you're interested in. So for example, I might say baby names two and then name. So that would give me Anna because I said what's in row number two column named name. The columns are also numbered, so you could do something like this, it's just that you shouldn't. It's the same. So this is like column number three, but column number three has a name, which is name, so you might as well just say name. Uh, so it's important that this is in quotes. If you do it not in quotes, that wouldn't work. Uh, in other languages, it's easy to explain why. In R, sometimes you don't need quotes. So, you, so in other languages, I could very well say, well, like if you say name, not in quotes, well, that's like the variable name. So that's clearly not what you want. In R, as it happens, sometimes you can get to not use quotes. So that explanation doesn't really fly. So the rule is just if you mean the column with this name, it has to be in quotes. Uh, and maybe name is a little bit confusing. So if I do prop, that would be this number over here. I can also just say I want row two and all the columns. And that just gives me all the columns correspond, uh, uh, but just row number two. I can similarly say, I'm not going to tell you what the row I want that I want is. I want the n uh, for every row. So that will just give me all the n's. All right. So okay. Uh, so uh, you can also use ranges. So you can do something like baby names and then rows two and up to six, and then all the columns. So that will give you rows two through six. You can also specify several columns. That's not really super useful, but you can do it. So maybe I want like the name and I want the year. So I can do that. If I specify several columns, I have to supply them as a vector. So this will be a vector that contains name and then year. And this will give me rows two through, six, uh, two through five. And one, okay. Uh, so two through five, and we have the name and we have the year. So the way this works is it's not including six. 
so just just two through five. So okay. Uh, so another thing that you'll see, and we'll have kind of so in R, there's multiple ways of achieving the same thing with data frames. We'll have kind of a standard way, but I want to teach you kind of all the different ways because maybe you'll write it the way I'll tell you to write it in about 10 minutes. But if you see our code, you'll see our, all sorts of things. So I want you to have seen it kind of at least once. Uh, so what you can do is you could say baby names dollar prop, for example, and that will give you the column prop like so. So here, uh, so this is maybe the first time that we see a really large vector. This is just a vector. So it's, it looks like it's kind of like a table. It's not really a table. This just says like this is element number one and this is element number two and so on. And then this is element number 11. And the 11 here just means that this one is number 11 and then this one is number 21 and so on. All right. Uh, so there is a little bit of a distinction between baby names dollar prop and the way the other way that we saw that you could do it is if you say baby names all the rows and then the column prop. And the difference is if you do this, what you'll get is another data frame or table in this case. Uh, so that's a table that's not a vector. Right, so the difference is, and this is really kind of a thin distinction, but at the same time, like if you don't know that and you try those things and they don't, don't work, you don't know what's going on. Uh, so I'll do like A1 is this, and I'll do A2 is baby names dollar prop. So now A2 is a vector, so that means if you say A2 at 1, you'll get the first element of the vector. On the other hand, if you say A2 at 1, uh, you also get that because I said A2 at 1, I meant A1 at 1, what you'll get is this. And that's because, so this is a weird way of using data frames. A1 is a data frame. So this is really getting column number 1 in data frame A1. So that's probably a lot to take in at once. Uh, so what you should know is you should really check whether a one or a two, whether it's a vector or a data frame or what, and use them accordingly. So if you wanted the first element of this, you would just say a two at one because a two is a vector. And if you wanted the first element for this, you would have to say a1, so you would say row 1 and then prop. And that's because A1 is a data frame with one column, which is prop. Does that all make sense? Okay. So, okay. So that's like that. Uh, so now let's do something interesting with this. Uh, so let's say that I want to know, well, something. Uh, so we'll just solve kind of a couple of problems here. Uh, so what is the most popular name in 1999? Right. So this is the kind of thing that starts getting a little bit difficult if you, so if you are good at Excel, you can figure out how to do it. But if you're just looking at this, like how would you do it? Like really unclear, right? Uh, so what can we do here? Well, I'll do it kind of one way now and we'll do it another way uh, soon. So. I'll do it with the tools that we already have. So the first thing I'll do is I'll get the data frame that just has the names from, from 1999. So how do I do that? Well, it's some subset of baby names. 
and the columns, I want to keep all the columns, right? Uh, how do I select just the rows for the year 1999? Well, the same way we did it with vectors. So I'll just say baby names dollar year. So that, remember, is a vector. And then I'll, I'll say equals equal 1999. So what am I doing here? This is, so this is all the years for all the rows. This is trues and falses where trues correspond to rows where the year is 1999 and falses correspond to all the other years. So that's a bunch of trues and falses. Here you just see falses because it starts with 1880. Yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, it's it's correct. Everything is good. I'm not sure I understand the question, but the answer is no. This is correct. Uh, that's the rows. That's right. That's because if we look at baby names, we're saying we want to select the rows such that the year is 1999. Right. So we give it a bunch of trues and falses where we select the trues, we discard the falses. So we have as many trues and falses as we have rows. So one true and false for each row. And then we pick out the rows that correspond to true. So, okay. And then we keep all the columns. So I'll run this. And this is how you should do it. Like always do it line by line. We run the line, we see, okay, like, what did we get from that? What's babies 1999? Well, looks okay, but we just have the first, so we just print by default the first 10. So I can just view it in order to see what it looks like. And I can say, okay, looks, 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 looks legit. Uh, so the way I usually check if I've selected a row with a certain property is I sort it one way and then I click again and I sort it another way. And if it starts with 1999, whether it's sorted one way or the other way, well, it's all 1999s. So, okay. So now we can say, okay, so, yeah, so I decided not to use periods actually, so. Uh, so, okay. So now what I'll do is I'll get the max count. Uh, so what I'm doing here, what is that? So what I'm doing here is I'm saying, get me all the numbers. Is that, yeah. So get me all the numbers for all the baby names and get me the largest number. Right. So this would be the uh, this would be a number that corresponds to one of the names. So this is the largest number of babies of the same name that were born in 1999. And usually, uh, kind of, I want to be careful here, and I would double check just manually that they computed it correctly for my data frame. So I can do that because I can sort like this. And then uh, I see that Jacob does correspond is the does correspond to the largest numbers with number which is three five three six one. So we're good. So okay. So now it's the same thing that we did with the physician salaries when we were looking for the specialty that has the highest salary. Right? We just want to select the name that corresponds to max name count. So how do we do it? Well, we have our vector of names. So this is the vector of names. And then we'll say, select the row such that max name count is equal to the n. So again, what's the trick here? So this is a bunch of trues and falses. So we have all the numbers here. So we're looking at this kind of table. We have all the numbers. 
and we're saying is this is this equal to 35 361 is this equal to 35 361 and so on and then the true in this big vector is just the location where n is equal to the maximum right so in this code here we're saying select the row, so select the element in names that corresponds to the maximum because this is a bunch of trues and falses and the one true corresponds to the location where max name count is equal to the n in that row there might be a tie in which case we'll get several so there you have it it's 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 jacob for 1999 Right. So that was all the names in general. Uh, so what you'll see if you kind of look around is in this data set is that in general, uh, all of the people, uh, so well, I guess like the top four people with the highest counts are all male names. Uh, and that's kind of a general phenomenon that you see is that like the male name or at least in the US in that period of time you'll see that male names have like very high concentration on the top so there's like a lot of mics a lot of mats and so on uh, whereas female names are like more distributed where the top one is not as frequent and then there is a lot of uncommon ones as well as there are, of course, with male names, but the patterns are not exactly the same. So let's say that they want the female name that's, uh, uh, that's as frequent as possible. How would they do that? Well, several ways. So one thing I could do is it could just say, okay, so when I'm computing babies 1999, I'll call it like babies 1999F, instead of just saying I want the rows where the year is 1999, I want to say that I just want the rows where the year is 1999 and also the sex is F. How do I do it? Well, just say and Baby, baby name sex is equal to f. Okay, so what's happening here? So this is a bunch of trues and falses where if the row says f, it's f. If the row says uh, not f, it's not. Uh, it's false. Sorry, the row says f, it's true. Otherwise, it's false. And then this says if the year is 1999, then it's true. Otherwise, it's false. And then. This is also going to be a bunch of trues and falses, and the only way it's going to be true now is if it's both the case that the year is 19, uh, 1999 and also the case that sex is equal to f. Meaning we select just the rows for the year 99 and sex equals f. Don't need to do anything else, right? So all we did is we just said we'll make a table with just the year 1999 and sex equals f, and then do exactly the same thing, find the row that corresponds to the highest n, and pick out the name from there. Uh, so if we do that, that view, we'll get that the most popular name registered under f is Emily in 1999. Make sense? So, okay. So let's say that we want to now write a function so that we won't have to copy and paste things every time, right? So here it was a little bit annoying and a little bit error prone because I kind of said, well, like all I need to do is I need, just need to add this thing to the line and then you'll notice that I decided that I want to change the name of this variable so to add this underscore f. Uh, of course, that could create all sorts of problems, right? So if I forget one uh, so if I forget the underscore f here, and it's very easy to forget, then everything is messed up. So usually you shouldn't pretty much ever copy and paste code and then change it around a little bit because that's a very error, error prone process. So what we have, the tool that we have for 
running code that's kind of similar but a little bit different is writing functions. So that's what I'll do. So I'll name the function most common name. And I'll give it the big table with all the baby names. I'll give it the year that I want and I give it the sex that I want. And then my goal here is to get the most common name for the specified year for the specified sex. So how do I do it? Well, it's basically this code, right? Except instead of specifying 1999 and F, I'll just use whatever is the input. So I'll just copy this. So don't need view because that'll open up a new table. I'll change the name again so that So I'll just name it babies. I mean, not a great name, but that's okay. And then here I'll just say year, and here I'll say sex, and I'm done. That's the function, right? So all I'm doing here is I did this example of for the year 99, for sex equals F, that's what I'm doing. And then I just said, okay, I just want to be able to plug in the year, plug in the sex, just into the formula and get the most common name. So didn't need to change any code, except I decided to change the, the name of babies 1999F to just generic babies. I didn't have to do it, it's just a name. Python R doesn't care, right? And that's the function. How does it work? Well, same as the code above, except you plug in here, you plug in sex. And now you don't have to copy and paste anymore because you can just run it for any year and any sex. Okay, uh, that's a coincidence. Uh, okay, in 1950 it was James, right? And no, don't need to copy and paste anything because I have a function. So the analogy here, and maybe I'm belaboring the point a little bit, but the analogy is like if you have f of x is like x squared plus one, then you can do f of five and you can also do f of six and f of 600 and so on. And all you need to do is to just say this. If you didn't have the function, you would have to write like 600 squared plus one, and then also five squared plus one and so on. So that would be more error prone. So it's much better to write a function where you just pass in whatever is the argument that you want currently, and it'll compute it for you. All right. So how do you come up with something like this? Uh, the best way, I think, especially if you're starting out, so like I, I can probably, fair to say, I think just write it from scratch. I happen to have it on the paper here, but I, I could. Uh, if you're just starting out, you shouldn't, like it's very easy to get into a state where you kind of maybe know what, what to do, but not exactly, and you're kind of stuck. So what I recommend is following the process here where you just say, okay, like, let me pick an example where I know the answer. And then let me just go line by line, write one line, check that I've made progress. So in this case, for example, check that baby's 1999F is what I want it to be. And then say, okay, like, what can I do with baby's 199F? So in this case, I did this, and then I did this line. And then once you have an example that's worked out, then you can generalize it and put it into a function. So that's especially useful if you're working in a computer where it's very easy to check. Uh, so on exams, you'll actually have to do it on paper. So in ESC 180, so it doesn't matter for this course, but in ESC 180, we'll talk about kind of techniques about 
that involve kind of writing exams on paper and stuff like that. Uh, and of course, like, you know, like, I, I don't think it was ever a good idea to do the exams on, on a computer. People have tried it. Uh, students complained actually more than they complain about paper exams. There's downsides that you don't see. But of course now, obviously we can't do it on a computer because there's chat GPT. Uh, so uh, you, you will have to write it on paper. So yeah, <laughs> it's, it's okay. And I, I, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss it later on. Uh, okay, so I think we're taking uh, a break until 8.19. I'll check the Discord and if you have questions. Oh, there's lots of stuff. You mean review the concepts? <laughs> Uh, sorry, I don't really understand the question. Like, no, it's not a question. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, when we have multiple data sheets. Well, so there, there's not really a concept of data sheets in uh, R, I wouldn't think. So you just have multiple data frames, that's definitely possible. And we'll see how to work with multiple data frames later on. Uh, so if you have multiple data frames and they're connected somehow, then sometimes you wanna merge them, things like that. So we'll talk about it later on. So the basic problem is the way I wrote it, right? It's, it's kind of assumed that baby name's year has the same size as baby name's sex, which makes sense here because those are just the co those are just different columns of the same table. What's a table? Well, it's you know a bunch of columns that are all the same length. If you have multiple data frames, then you shouldn't expect that you have like the same length of columns in the different sheets. So that create there's no reason to assume that, so this particular technique is not going to be as useful. Oh, so, so like, table is just, like, like a rectangle in general? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so actually kind of during the break, uh, so what I want you to do is to install, uh, so just do, so just do install tidyverse. If that crashes, which for some of you it inevitably will, uh, try install packages dippler, which is faster and works better at that. So eventually we'll need the entire tidyverse thing, but for now Dippler is, will do. So please run this.
what are some built-in function in R? Well, some comes to mind. Some is a function. Uh, you can you can sum vectors. Uh, there is mean. There is all sorts. You know. There's abs, square root. That is fine. Yes, that's that that is normal. Yeah. Okay. All right. So uh, I now want to talk about. So this is called uh, wrangling data frames. And this is just a term that people use. So wrangle means like kind of handle shape according to what you want, something like that. Uh, so, and this is gonna be about kind of processing data frames so that we can extract the data that we need from them. And the first thing I want to do is going to look at first a little bit unrelated, but uh, you'll see how it matters. So this is composition of functions. So first of all, I just want to do it kind of in a math sense. So if you have like f of x is x squared, and then you have g of y is y plus 2, you can do something like f of g of 5, right? And what is it going to do? Well, we already saw it, so I'm writing it kind of in math, right? So f of g of 5 is going to be f of 7, and that's going to be 49, right? So this kind of thing is referred to as co the composition of f and g, right? So this is just kind of saying f of g of h, whatever. So let me write it in R. So x is x squared, and then I'll do g, and here I'll write it as y plus 2. Uh, so by the way, here I wrote it as I wrote it as x and then x squared, and here I wrote it as y and then y plus 2. Of course, those names don't matter. I could I could equally well say that g is also a function of x. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, you should be right like that. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, actually, in R, I think the caret works as well. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, like in Python, it's just a double star, and it's better to write it like that. Uh, so, okay. So, that's the same, and similarly how to how you can do it in math, you can say f of g of 5. All right, and that's going to be, so I need to define F first. So here I press Control Enter. So F is now read in, press Control Enter again. So G is now read in, and now I can compute 
f of g of 5, which, like we said, is 49. So now, uh, hopefully, you've installed tidyverse, or if not, then at, le at least you installed Dippler. So people usually say Dippler. Uh, actually, Dippler is not enough. You need tidyverse. Uh, so, okay. So you can write the same thing in a different way. So you can say five, and then this thing is called a pipe, and then you can say G, and then you can say F. And this is the same as F of G of five. So the way I think about it, so one for one, like what R does is like literally it just takes this and it transforms into into f of g of five. But the way you can think about it is start with five and then transform it with g. And then transform g so it I mean five and then transform g of 5 with f to get f of g of 5. Right. So it turns out that when you're wrangling data, data frames, and we'll see examples in a second, this is a useful way to be able to write it, although, of course, you can always write it like this as well. Right. And the, the way we think about it is we start with 5 and then transform it with g. So that means this part is g of 5 and then transform this thing with f, so that's f of g of 5. Is that cool? So, all right, uh, so that's like that. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, so one more thing, uh, and if you don't know other programming languages, then it's not that exciting, but in R, you can say something like this. And that would be exactly the same thing. So you can write the function as G and then open parentheses, close parentheses, and then you're still passing the five. So that's going to become, so we are not, so this is kind of useful to you more if you know other programming languages so that you see why the syntax that we're about to use actually makes sense. But basically what you need to understand is this is the same as f of g of 5. So okay. So that's composition. Uh, and here's how it can be useful. So Again, this is after you do library tidy first. Uh, here's a function that you can use. It's called filter. And the way it works is you can say filter year is, for example, 1880, and sex is, for example, F. So what this does is produce a data frame that consists of rows of baby names and of course if you give it something other than baby names that would also work where the value in column year is 1880 and the value at column sex is f right so that's exactly the kind of thing we had done before where we wanted to select some rows. It's just that you can do it with this function filter. Right? So that's just going to give you the rows where the year is 1880 and the sex is F. So another way in which you can write it is baby names and then pipe and then filter, and then year is 1880, and sex is F. Or you can do a comma, like we had done before. So that's the same. Why is it the same? Well, because the pipe just says, take baby names and stick it in here. 
So here we just have one function. So you could also imagine doing something like this. So you'd say baby names, and then you'll filter, and you just say the year is 1880. And then you say, I want to do another filter, sex equals F. So what's going on here? So this part is just apply filter with year equals 1880. And then this is saying, take this and stick it into filter with sex equals F. So that will just give you the rows from this thing, which is baby names, but just for 1880. And that's going to be baby, baby names, but just for the year 1880, and also sex equals F. So that's going to be like this. So that's going to become kind of more and more convenient the more things you can do. Because here, instead of writing something cumbersome, so this is like a little bit cumbersome, you can just do one thing at a time. So you can say, I want to filter this data frame so that they just keep the rows with the year equals 1880. And then I want to keep going and say, take this and just keep the rows with sex equals F. Okay. Uh, so similarly, and that's going to be useful, uh, you can use select. And select is kind, kind of, sort of, like filter, but for columns. So you can say, for example, select year name. And that's going to give you the data frame with just the columns year and name. is create a data frame all right so you can do it with this So, okay, so uh, questions so far, is this good? So uh, I hear people typing, so I'll pause for a little bit and switch to Discord, to people saying. Uh, is there preferable naming? Uh, well, so like I decided to use pothole case. Uh, people sometimes in R kind of, people like use, to use periods instead of the underscores. Uh, what is the shortcut uh, install tidyverse, but the console says, well, you install tidyverse, but did you say library tidyverse? Uh, so what's the shortcut for uh, this? That's an excellent question. So the shortcut is control shift M. Yeah, and command shift on the Mac, I believe. So not like a hundred percent sure about Mac, you can Google that, it'll tell you. But they think it's command shift time. Yeah. 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 Alright. Are people doing on Discord? Yeah, so those those are the same. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, that's also a good point. So they do work the same way, but the years are different. So, okay. So all right. So that's like that. Uh, so now we're gonna do something that's a little bit complicated. So 
here is something that you might like to do. So what we want is we want to actually sorry. So let me uh, let me do something else before. So that's summarize. So compute some function of a column. So for example, I can say baby names, summarize, and then here I can say, I wanna do some kind of operation on the column. So for example, I'll say like, per name is mean of n. So this is what it's gonna do. Uh, and what it did is it created a new data frame with this column per name. And this is just the mean of the column n, right? So the column n is the count of how many names there are uh, for each name. And here what it did is just compute the overall mean for all the names, all the years. So that's not super useful. You could do it before as well. So where it really helps is, let's say that they want the average count for sax equals m and for sax equals f. So I can do it manually, right? So I can just separately say, baby names and then filter sex equals F and then summarize. Forgot to close the quotes, so that's why it was all green. So that's the average count for female names and then the average count for male names is like this. So like I said, kind of there is like less variety in male names. So the average count is higher, uh, but that's, that's kind of how, uh, that, that's how it is. Uh, now, what I can do is I can group rows. So I'll show you how to do it. This is like one of those like not super easy concepts. And then I'll do the same thing. So what group by does is it makes sure that when I use summarize, I don't compute actually the mean for all the ends. I separate the rows into the ones where sex equals M and the ones where sex equals F. And then I compute the mean of N for one group of rows, the ones with sex equals M, and then for another group of rows, the ones with sex equals F. So that's gonna be the outcome. It'll just compute both of those. Uh, so let me try to give you kind of a small example. So let's say that our data frame looks like this. Uh, so you have like, I'll do like name and I'll do like n. I'm not gonna do uh, I'm not gonna do years uh, and I'll do sex and then Mike is gonna be uh, uh, sorry, 200 and this is M and then Matt is gonna be 150 and M and then Mary. It's gonna be whatever, 120 and F. Uh, uh, what's a good name that starts with M? That's a female name, Madeline. I don't know how to spell it. Uh, okay, so Madeline is gonna be 160 with sex F, right? So when I do group by, what R does is it keeps track of, okay, this is one group of rows because it's one value for sex. And then this is another group of rows, so that's another, another group of values with all the same sex. 
And then when I say mean of n, it says, okay, I'll compute the mean of all the entries in n for one group, so for example, for f, and then for another group for m. And here, so I still specify that I'll have the column per name, but you also have to have the column sex because you now computed the means for two different groups and you need to specify which group the, uh, which group the number came from. So this column is created automatically because the rows were grouped by sex. Right? So that's like that. So I'll, we'll, 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 do, we'll do some exercise in that. Which I've lost. Uh, so if you haven't installed Gapminder, please install it now. So that would be install packages Gapminder. So that should be easier than Tidyverse. So this is like that. And I'll start typing the question. I'll give people time to kind of look at it. Uh, so... Uh, so if you do library gap minder, so this is something that we briefly saw. This is what uh, this is. This is the table that you have, and now our goal is to figure out how many countries there are in Asia. So the first thing I would do is I would say, okay, like Afghanistan here appears multiple times. Well, because there is an entry for each different year, but you can just take the country, well, I mean, assuming in this case correctly, I believe that every country appears in every year, you can just say, okay, I'll just look at whatever, like 1992, and then what you wanna do is, okay, so you have this table and there's countries in Asia, but also countries not in Asia, so you just wanna select Select is a bad word because an R select means select columns. So you want to get a data frame with just the rows that correspond to Asia. And then you just want to know the size of, uh, the, size of the data set. Uh, so one way to do it is uh, if you look at dim gap minder, that's going to give you the size of the data frame. So that would be the number of rows. So in this case, the number of rows is 17, uh, 1,704. And then the number of columns is six. Uh, so basically you want the size of the data frame with just Asian countries in one particular year. Make sense? So I'll write out the plan for this and I'll let you write it.
see a lot of people are, are doing the function already, and it's fine if you do that. However, if you're a staff, I would suggest that you question one. So okay. So if I just want that, what I can do is I can say, okay, so we start with GapMinder, and then we say, just get me the rows where the continent is Asia, and the year is 1992. And then take this and give all of that to them, which gets you the size of the data set, uh, of the data frame. So this is 33 rows and six columns. Six columns is not, doesn't really concern us. Uh, we just want the first element here, so the 33. So that is 33. So now let's say that we want to give an arbitrary continent, so not just Asia. Uh, so we'll just make a little function, right? So count countries. 
and we'll give it gapminder. Uh, we'll give it the continent. So here, uh, so people correctly kind of intuited that like it's better to be careful and not name the column the same thing as the argument that might lead to trouble. So we'll just say uh, C-O-N-T and then we'll have so the year will set to be constant. So here, we'll just set year to be 1992 so that if in the future I want to change it, I can easily change it by just changing this guy. And now I'll do what I usually do, which is because I already had a solution for a specific situation, so for Asia in this case, I'll just copy and paste this and make it more generic. So here I'll say that I want an arbitrary continent rather than just Asia, and I'm done. I'll now make sure that it actually works. So for Asia, it still gives 33, and then we'll try like Europe, and that would be 30, and so on. Make sense? So that that sh really should be the process. And honestly, I think kind of like there are some people who are extremely experienced for whom what makes sense is you just write it from scratch. Uh, however, for most things, for most people, including me, you want to start with a concrete example. Just do step by step. So just first do, okay, like does this make sense? Okay, that seems to make sense. That's just countries in Asia. And then we want the size, so we just give it to them. And then, okay, so now we have this vector 33, 6. So now we'll select the first element, 33, so that we get the size. And once we get it working on one example, then we just copy and paste it into the body of the function and modify it so that it's general. Uh, that kind of process just works, whereas lots of other things just don't. So. Um, regarding the dimension function right there, um, how can you tell like if it's going to print the row or it's going to print the column? Uh, I mean, you just know that dimension. I, I mean, like it. Well, I mean, the direct answer is you can look up what it does, and the way you would do it is, for example, question mark dim, oh. and it'll tell you that. Well, will it tell you? <laughs> Uh, uh, okay, it actually won't tell you, so you have to go to data frame and you might need to check on the internet. Anyway, like it's just like that's what it does. It always gives you number of rows times times or number of columns for the data frame. Say again? Yeah, yeah, it's true that you can change it, yeah. So, okay. Um, so, that's like that. Uh, so, is there any anything on Discord? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's uh, yeah, so it's not so continent equals continent R has no way of knowing that the first continent is the column name and the second continent is the variable name, so that would not work. Uh, but it, it's really dependent. Like in some situations, it, it it might. So yeah, like if you write it like that, it wouldn't. All right, uh, okay, uh, I think we're like almost at 9 p.m. Uh, so I think what we'll do is we'll retire for the day and I'll see you on Thursday. Uh, so the first exercise I think is due Friday and then I'll post some more, more exercises for working with data frames and also we'll kind of have a little bit more exercises in class on Thursday. Uh, so basically I taught you now well, of course, kind of, it's it's a different thing to like learn the rules versus learn how to apply the rules. But you basically have like almost all the rules to process 
any kind of table right now. Now it's just a matter of figuring out how to put things together, which we'll spend uh, kind of some, some time on, and that in part it just comes with experience. But we'll be doing lots of practice uh, kind of in the coming few lectures. All right. Okay, thanks. Bye. Um, so there's no dim at three. So you could have an object that's like a three-dimensional matrix where dim at three would make sense. That would be like the third dimension or something. But it wouldn't be like dim at three. It would be like dim of object at three is what you mean probably. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, there, there's no. So there's no like three D data frame, but there are certainly like three D matrices. So they're sometimes called tensors. How to use external table? Uh, well, so in a way we had done it, right? So it just that. Uh, so I think by external table you mean like something that's not uh, that's not typed in here, and we've done it. So we've downloaded baby names and then we loaded it. Uh, so in principle, uh, kind of the easiest thing you can do. So I'll, I'll show you. Like let's say that you want to write uh, a file, so it's going to be kind of like many baby names. So the thing that we had before. Actually, what they what they'll do is, uh, I'll find, yeah, I, uh, yeah. So I guess uh, I guess here's what they'll do. So I'll, I'll I'll write a CSV file that's just the countries in Asia in the year 1992. So something like this, and here I'll say select. Uh, so I guess country and GDP, and they do that. Uh, GDP doesn't exist. <laughs> For some countries, that's true. Uh, uh, yeah, so it's GDP per capita. So this is just this. So just for the one year for Asian countries. And now I'll write the, so what I'll do is I'll set my working directory to this. And I'll write this. like this. Uh, so now what I've done is I've written the file a.csv which has the data. So this is what that looks like. So I just created this. And now if I want to read it back, I can. So I can say like b is read.csv a.csv and it's probably a little bit messed up. Uh, so here you have the table B that I've read in from disk. And this CSV, I could open it as well, right? So I can go to my DS101 folder, and I wrote this ACSV thing, and I can open it in, in calc and edit it, whatever. Uh, so at one is not for the data frame, it's for dim of the data frame, right? So the dim of the data frame is the size of the data frame. So at this point, this is, the, this is a data frame. So this is just the countries in Asia in 1992. And then I say, give it to dim. And that says that, okay, if you do dim of that data frame, then it says that the size of it is 33 rows by six columns. And then I pick the one to get the number of rows. So that's just going to be one. Uh, 
uh, isn't data frame at one just data frame? Uh, so no, so data frame. Uh, I mean, so it was at one of them, not of data frame. Data frame at one. Uh, it's actually a little bit unfortunate, but that would be uh, the first column of the data frame. So you sh shouldn't do it. Yeah. All right, have a good one. Bye, see ya. Yeah.